everybody. Uh, my name is Mark Hersey. I'm the director of the Center for the History of Agriculture, Science, and the Environment of the South, Chases. Uh, this is the first Chases event of the year. Uh, uh, Chases is a research center. It's centered in the history department. For those of you who don't, uh, don't know it, uh, it um, is there to advance the to research in uh, its, current, its central fields, agricultural history. Um, the uh, history department was the uh, headquarters, uh, the executive headquarters of the Agricultural History Society for a decade. Uh, history of Science, uh, the, uh, my colleagues Alex Huey and Matt Levine just stepped down after five years as the editors of the History of Science uh, pub uh, Society's publications, Isis and Osiris, uh, and Environmental History, which is what I was trained in, and along with my colleague Stephen Brain, who's written some of the forests, um, we uh, edit the journal Environmental History, uh, which is published by the American Society for Environmental History and the Forest History Society. Uh, Chases does a number of things. It hosts lectures, it hosts symposia, and it also hosts what we call experiment stations, which are nods to the land grant setting that we're in, uh, and they're mostly workshops for uh, largely for graduate students and for faculty in the history department. They talk for 10 minutes, and then they field questions for 50 minutes, and then everybody goes home and <laughs> continues a conversation at a bar. Uh, this started when we, uh, all, when a bunch of the faculty had young kids, and five o'clock was the end time. Uh, and then it occurred to me, uh, environmental history is a multi, sort of an inherently interdisciplinary field. Uh, and so it might be really good in a land grant setting to have uh, scientists, scholars, and other disciplines come and talk to uh, people in, the, in, in Chase's faculty and grad students. So we've had um, religious studies people, linguists, sociologists, anthropologists, corn geneticists, entomologists, uh, but we've never had uh, someone who's a forester or wildlife uh, uh, biologist come, um, which is uh, surprising in some ways because it's one of the things that we do write about is forest history. In fact, uh, Owen Hyman is here. His dissertation a few years ago uh, won the uh, best dissertation prize from the Southern Historical Association, and it's about uh, forestry in, or forest in the uh, Southern Coastal Plain, and then a couple of years later, another of our students, Fraser Livingston, won the best dissertation prize about longleaf development of conservation science and longleaf forests uh, from the Agricultural History Society. So, um, Alex Harvey is about the ideal person, our, our uh, guest today, uh, to uh, be an, an, an intersections uh, speaker here. Um, he, his own, his life's work intersects with a lot of what we do. Uh, plus, he's an alumnus of Mississippi State University. So, we're glad to have him back. Uh, I was introduced uh, to Alex earlier this year by Hal Herring, uh, as we were both independently part of the Backcountry Hunters and Anglers podcast and blast. Um, and so uh, Hal put us uh, in, in, in touch with each other. Here's some other family connections, Sam Cook, uh, for instance. But it became clear almost immediately as we began talking that we had to have him up. Uh, Alex is a uh, native of, uh, of Mississippi, uh, born in Hines County, right? Grew up in Holmes County in the hills right on the, along the edge of, uh, of the Delta. And he's made a life's work, um, his life's work is deeply influenced by what we as landscape and environmental historians think about. Uh, Pierce Lewis sort of famously said that landscape is our unwitting autobiography, right? That it reflects uh, our values, cultural values, what we think about as a, as a culture. Um, and it's, because it's unwitting, it's actually more honest than a biography that we would write ourselves. Uh, and this is what Alex deals with uh, every day. So he graduated from Mississippi State in the early 2000s, went up to Northwest Pennsylvania, Allegheny National Forest, came back temporarily to the DeSoto National uh, Forest, and temporarily has become, I think, forever, <laughs> more, more or less. Uh, he's done a bunch of really interesting things. Uh, his life, really, his life story is a, a remarkable one. It's been featured in a number of things. Right now, it's currently being featured by the Theodore Roosevelt Conservation uh, Partnership. Is that right? Um, and uh, in addition to this really remarkable personal story, he is the owner and CEO of Legacy Land Management and is doing hugely important work here in Mississippi and in, and in Alabama. And it's our real pleasure to have Alex here today. So please join me in welcoming him. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you all. Um, 
So yes, um, my name is Alex Harvey. I'm a consulting forester and wildlife biologist. Um, I work as a consultant. Um, where to begin? So I just want to jump right into it. 2014, I went to work for a historic civil rights organization called the Federation of Southern Cooperatives Land Assistance Fund. And um, that organization was actually started by Dr. King's SCLC, Southern Christian Leadership Conference, Southern Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. All these organizations came together to help farmers back in the late 60s um, with some of the issues that they were having. So they developed all these sort of farming cooperatives. Later on, they started realizing, obviously, that forest land and timber was a hugely important asset. And um, it just was always sort of a nut that they could never crack. <coughs> Um, another esteemed graduate, or an esteemed graduate, I don't consider, I don't consider myself an esteemed graduate yet, but um, Carlton Owen, who the, the College of Forest Resources hosts the Carlton Owen Lecture Series, uh, he was the, the president of, uh, uh, I can't even think at the moment, I'm going blank, but um, U.S. Endowment for Forestry and Communities, there you go. So. Um, his uh, philanthropy was funding this sort of experimental project to sort of uh, figure out what the hurdles were for African-American forest landowners in particular to participate in USDA conservation programs. And I had no knowledge of actually the larger thing. I just heard about an opportunity to work with a civil rights organization and I thought it was kind of cool. So I went to work for them and it sort of came out that they had this idea of profiling African-American forest landowners, right? And sort of understanding what it was that uh, precluded, that acted as a barrier for these landowners participating in USDA conservation programs like tree planting and prescribed burning and fire lanes and all these things because USDA had a lot of money that they wanted to give these landowners and they couldn't really figure out how to do that, right? Well. <coughs> My job was to figure out what those barriers were. So uh, there were four pilot sites to this thing uh, initially. Uh, the Federation of Southern Cooperatives in Alabama, another one called the Limited Resource Lender and Assistance Network. I was the forester for both in Alabama. There was a forester in South Carolina for the Center for Ayers Property Preservation. And then there was another one in uh, North Carolina uh, with the Roanoke Electric Cooperative. And so we sort of, uh, you know, we piloted the idea of how to uh, address the specific needs, concerns of working with uh, this subset of very important landowners because in many ways, the issues that these landowners face are kind of the canary in the coal mine for a lot of the issues that private forest landowners are dealing with today. And so uh, what we did for three years uh, was, was packed with uh, understanding why these landowners didn't necessarily trust all the institutions that had been long established, like the State Forestry Commissions or the, the NRCS, Natural Resource Conservation Service, Farm Service Agency. So then we kind of got into some really complicated, you know, very uh, difficult things, uh, conversations to discuss. And a big part of that was discrimination a long, a long well-documented uh, history of discrimination on the part of the USDA. And, you know, I learned so much about the world during these three and a half years. It was three and a half of the toughest years that I can recall. Um, but one of the things was um, this, this history of landowners uh, not necessarily being engaged in these local programs from county to county of being able to go into their local county offices uh, for these programs and sort of uh, apply. This is really important because if landowners don't um, get the sort of investment that all farmers need, then they ultimately are sort of left high and dry with this huge debt of owning land, needing to move forward and doing something with it, but not being able to do so. And that was the precursor to something that we call the Great Migration, right? Where many African Americans decided to leave the South and go elsewhere. Um, so, what we initially started to understand was this really complicated history of why African-American forest landowners didn't engage in these programs. And it was because they had gone into these offices many years ago and they had faced these issues. And so there was still this sort of 
collective memory of why they wouldn't. Or in this, this, this turned into lots of other issues. For instance, uh, the issue of timber sales, which is the thing that, that sort of drove me into becoming a consulting forester, um, because you, you, I began to see all of this loss, right, where, and I, I want to I preface this by saying my job is not to beat up on anybody, <laughs> but I tend to, to use the term timber buyer or logger, et cetera, in sort of a harsh way, and that's only because what you see is if these landowners don't hire or understand the institution of what a consulting forester is and how that institution has created wealth in these communities for so long, then they're sort of left to anybody that'll work with them. And timber buyers tend to prey on these folks because they don't know, they don't understand. They don't understand how these transactions take place of selling your timber and who you should talk to and how things should go. And so this became another huge sort of lightning rod issue. And it's, it is one of, not the most, but one of the most complicated issues in terms of working with private landowners that are, that are minorities because they have, uh, for so long, they've sort of uh, heard this narrative of how this transaction ought to happen or who should buy their timber and why and this kind of thing. And so they have a lot of trust issues for everybody. They don't know who foresters are as a profession. If you graduate from Mississippi State and you are, you say a forester, it doesn't really matter who you are or who you work with or what your specific discipline is, they don't know and they don't really care. Many of whom will, you know, disregard you. Some of them will listen to what you have to say and ask you specific questions, but what they don't understand is not all foresters can help them because we all do different things based on the different research interests or disciplines that we have, et cetera, et cetera. And so um, my interest became in specifically helping folks not get taken advantage of during their timber sales. That simple thing became the rest of my life, <laughs> right? Um, you know, I would, I would uh, hear so many horror stories about things, I'll never forget, I was, Still working with the nonprofit at the time, it was a, 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 a professor within the extension, <clears throat> uh, called me uh, one day and said, Alex, I got a story to tell you. I said, well, what is it? He said, I just want to share this. Said, okay, fine. He said, uh, there's a, a lady, uh, she's African American, she has about uh, 200 acres in uh, Carroll County, Mississippi. And he said, um, she lost her husband about three months ago, and a uh, a person knocked on her door on a Sunday uh, with a check for $80,000. Somebody she'd never seen before, they knocked on the door and they said, hey, here's a check, we want to buy your timber, right? So now her husband's just passed, she's kind of dealing with all this stuff, she has no idea what's going on, and um, she's, you know, got a big check in her hand, she's like, okay, what do I do? Most people would probably have taken the check, closed the door, and never worried about it, right? I've seen that more times than I can count. This lady was a little bit different. She said, no, uh, I need to think about it, right? And she, uh, she remembered that there was a flyer that had come in the mail for what turned out to be a timber valuation workshop that the Mississippi State Extension was hosting. So she showed up at this workshop and she met with the Extension and they said, well, we need to help you hire a consulting forester. Um, so, so she did. <coughs> when they went out and actually did the appraisal on the timber, it turned out to be worth $470,000, right? So if she had taken the check for $80,000, she would have taken a tremendous loss. The reality is that most people don't know the loss that they have taken if they take that check, right? Now, you might say, well, Alex, why is that important, <laughs> right? I'll tell you why. So um, I'll never forget, I had a lady landowner. She, um, she, she confided that she, had, she was a two-time breast cancer survivor. Um, she owned 80 acres um, just across the Mississippi state line in Alabama. And she, um, she came into the USDA office one day, really worked up, and they just wanted to get her out of there because <laughs> they didn't know what was going on. Well, um, they called me. And they said, can you help whatever these challenges are? Like, can you just talk to us? I said, sure. 
So we got her enrolled in USDA programs, uh, very basic, you know, we're gonna get you a forest management plan, we'll help you sort of understand what's going on in your property. So she told me a story <laughs> later. She said, um, um, I had a bad experience in the courthouse. The courthouse actually turned out to be where the USDA office was. So I, I was kind of like, okay, well, what are you saying? Um, she said, well, I, I just had a bad experience. I didn't know what it was. Later, we had to go back to the, to the courthouse to, um, to, to fill out some paperwork for USDA programs. Very simple, very basic. It ended up taking us 15 minutes when we got there. But on the particular day that I went, one thing that I would do is I would actually pick my landowner clients up and I would just drive them there. You know, we just kind of have a relaxing day. We talk about things and kind of calm down because a lot of the elderly landowners that I was working with were very resistant to these USDA programs. They didn't understand. It was complicated. They thought they were going to lose their land. So I was always sort of very personal, right? Um, so we go to the courthouse and <laughs> I'll never forget, I walk in, I walk through the security, I was on the other side, she was still standing there, she was clutching her purse. And I thought, you know, what, what? so I, I said, come on, you know, let's go. And she, she stood there and she thought about it for a second. She hurried up, she sat her purse around the security system. This is a lady that was well into her 70s. Um, she, she sat her purse over there. The security guard was distracted, I remember, so he never really realized what was happening. She hurried through. We signed the paperwork. We scurried out of the courthouse. When we got back, she, she opened my truck door, sat her purse on the floorboard. The purse fell open, and there was a 38 pistol and a, and a knife inside the purse. And I'm thinking, what in the world? Did I, like, what is going on? Like, this, okay, ho, oh, <laughs> somebody explain this, right? So I asked her, why do you have that? What is, and she said, he wasn't in there, let's go. And I'm like, okay, whoa, I, I was just a part of a crime here, <laughs> so no, we're not going anywhere, right? You got to explain this, right? And she, she was really animated. She said, no, he wasn't there. Let's go, take me home. So I took her home. Later, via a conversation with this lady, what I found out <clears throat> was that uh, a timber buyer had gotten a job in the mapping office of the county courthouse. Nothing to do with USDA in any way. And she had gone in there one day. He had saw, you know, what her situation was. He bought her timber. He only gave her $5,000 for 80 acres of timber. And when she questioned him about it, he threatened her, right? These are the kind of things that happen behind all the stuff that we don't really want to talk about. Right? And so this is why this issue pushed me so hard. And every day it's still, I get emotional, I'm sorry. But it shouldn't have happened. You know, something like that just should not happen. And, um, you know, I, I've just, I've dedicated a lot of time to try and figure out how to help these communities and how to help people. We, we have a lot of challenges in terms of what our profession looks like. And we need to have some conversations internally about how we do things. but. Um, it's, a, it's a huge issue because, as you see in that particular case, a 70-year-old lady created a criminal act that didn't have to happen when all it needed was a conversation, right? And um, these things happen more often than not in that particular instance. But, you know, um, well, the long and the short of this is the thing that drives me the most is I, I was, I'm just a kid who loved to grow up, grow up hunting. Uh, you know, uh, in Holmes County, my dad joined a hunting club <clears throat> in Holmes County, Mississippi, and it was all African American. These guys were very fortunate because at that time in Holmes County, it was very common for African American landowners to own large tracts of land. So these guys accumulated access to about 10,000 acres of contiguous forest land from the hills into the delta, some of the best hunting land anywhere. And that's where I grew up. Well, afterwards, I saw the land ownership changed hands. The, one of the number one causes of land loss in the African American community is something called heirs property, which is another really complicated historical thing where, so the period of reconstruction is really important to African Americans who acquired land, 
right after Reconstruction around 1910, uh, African Americans owned roughly 15 million acres in the United States. Today it's less than 3 million. And the projection is we're losing 30,000 acres a year, right? So um, there are lots of reasons for me. For me, it's sense of identity and culture that I grew up and witnessed. But it's also the sense of culture of who we are as a country. And the reality that what I'm talking about and where I work are the lands where the blues was born, right? There are lands where culinary traditions came out of. And lands where um, a lot of really important things took place, right? There would be no rock and roll without Robert Johnson. Yes, I just said that, <laughs> right? But it's important. Um, so um, I don't want to ramble on, Doc. You can, you can stop me whenever. <laughs> OK, all right. Yeah, I'll stop. Any questions? We can just make this conversation. No, it's okay. I'm cool. Yeah. Come on, somebody got to start. Go ahead. Alex, I heard you say on a, a leadership podcast that you spend 70 or 80% of your time building trust. Yeah. Yeah. Could you elaborate on that? Yes, sir. So, again, you know, uh, landowners in general, it doesn't matter, you know, what their ethnic background is, they, they don't trust a lot of people because of some of the really, so, you know, so what we know is that consulting forestry is an institution that sort of evolved when land-grant institutions came about, right? And sort of the wealthier people at that time understood the asset that they had in terms of forest land and timber. Well, they also understood that they were sending their nephews and whomever to these forestry schools so that they could come out and, and help address some of the challenges of, who do we sell our timber to and how does that happen and how, you know, how do we not get taken advantage of, right? Well, one of the things that happened is minority communities were left out. You know, lack of representation, there's just not a lot of consulting forces that look like me, right? And what the endowments research found when they were profiling African American landowners was that one of the things that these landowners said was we don't see people that look like us inside of this profession, right? And so that, again, is one of the reasons why a lot of bad decisions are made, you know? And so, um, yeah, it, you know, in my minority communities, landowners in general don't know, well, what, is a, what does a, a, a county forester, a service forester with the Mississippi Forestry Commission do than a, differently than a consulting forester does? Or what does a forester that works within RCS, the Natural Resource Conservation Service, do that's different than you know, an extension forester, right? So that's really important, Doc. Those are some of the conversations that we really have to have. And I, and I you know, I'll, I kind of push the envelope because I'm Alex and I always have. But, you know, um, one of the challenges that we have is, you know, when I was a student here, ethics was, I'll never forget some of the conversations we had, Dr. Grebner, about ethics, right? <laughs> and how that was never to be compromised. Right? And it would never be accepted. But now that I've gotten to the professional side of things, it, it seems that we don't have that same commitment. You know? And unless we do, we're going to have problems in the future. Because a lot of the issues that we're talking about in terms of climate change and all these, the foresters have a lot to contribute to that conversation. But we're not in those spaces. Not in the way that we should, that we should be. right? And that is how we build trust in communities. I, I'll be frank with you. When I went over to Alabama and I was doing this, it was tough. I, didn't, I felt out of place in many ways. I'm doing grassroots work in these communities. And it was just tough. People did not trust me for anything. But once they saw that I had their best interest at heart and that I would advocate for them, then they, uh, they would open up a little bit. They'd invite me to cook out on the weekend. <laughs> you know, why don't you come on Thanksgiving or something like that, right? And my wife will tell you, I spent tons of time during those years away from home at times when I should have been because it was just about building trust. And as a consultant, it's even more so because landowners do understand I, I could get taken advantage of in this timber sale transaction or who's going to, you know, or how much should I pay this guy to burn my pines, right? Because the, I've, I've seen all types of horrors. There's the people who call themselves contractors who are just out there that just, their whole thing is just about making a buck as opposed to leaving something behind, right, which is what we were taught, that contributes to a broader legacy, right? 
and so that, that is a yeah, it's a very enduring thing. If I could tie something in there real quick. Again, I'm, I'm associate dean over in College of Forestry Resources. We have some senior forestry students in here that in less than two weeks will be taking the registered forester exam. And one of the reasons there is a registered forester exam is that, and we have a high percentage pass rate, one reason there is is because in the 70s and before, before there was a registration system in Mississippi, just anybody could call himself or herself a forester, right. and they could do this predatory work. Mm -hmm. In fact, we had a, a noun for that, pen hookers. Mm -hmm. That's right. Still That's call right. them that. And so, <laughs> and so it was white landowners, black landowners, everybody yeah. could be subject to that. And, and truly, now it continues, mm -hmm. especially in the African-American community. Yeah. Uh, it also happens that like, I have a small holding family land that I purchased from generation somebody back in my wife's family bought you know, a huge chunk of acreage and over the years it kind of it whittled down to small and small acreages and I did an assessment so I knew what the value of the land was and I remember one day getting this mail letter in the mail mm -hmm. from some realtor saying oh I'll give you $37,000 for this 120,000 yeah. acres yeah. of land when it's yeah. worth yeah, you know, 150,000 without even talking about the timber, and it's just, and this just was random. You know, people trying to take advantage of others. Man, that is that happens. So my, we get it. We, we get we bought a home in a pretty nice subdivision in Long Beach, and we get letters all the time from people saying we want to buy your house, <laughs> and I've never indicated in any way that I want to sell my house. But the reality is that that is how a lot of people are taking advantage of. Like so, the number one most volatile issue that I work with is hunting leases. I never anticipated this one. <laughs> but if you ever watch Yellowstone, which I'm a big fan of Yellowstone, it's a great show, hunting leases are a lot like Yellowstone. Anything could happen, <laughs> right? And um, I've never seen the level of, uh, it's almost warfare even, you know, the sort of undermine, like I, I got a family right now that I'm working with. They got 500 acres um, in Hines County. And they, their property, actually, they had an heirs property issue. So if, if anyone doesn't understand heirs property, what it is, somebody passes away, they don't leave a will. And that creates a very complicated legal situation. So um, in the African-American community, several things happen. One is African Americans after the period of reconstruction going into segregation etc didn't trust the legal system right so they didn't hire attorneys to do some of these estate things and then there's also the reality that there's a lot of superstition on the parts of older community in older generations where if I if I sign a will I'm probably going to check out pretty soon right um, when I'm a lot of the families that I work with they, they're generations. I, I, I know of a case right now of 800 acres of some of the most prime river bottom land anywhere that's got over 200 heirs, right? There's no way that everybody is going to agree, right? And so, you know, I'm working with a family right now. They've got 500 acres. They um, have this, th their land was elevated all the way to the state Supreme Court where they were trying to clear title and get everybody who was not involved actually out of it. Um, we, we just settled on a hunting lease situation, but the issue that that caused in their family was um, uh, one particular family member wanted his friend to lease the property. And uh, this particular friend hadn't paid the hunting lease in over three years, <laughs> right? So the fam, you know, some of the sort of more organized folks decided, you know, we, we can't continue like this. You know, we have to make economic return. So uh, they called me, and we literally just worked through their hunting lease situation. But um, the the division that it is caused, just, and that's kind of the people fact. One of the, one of the reasons why I hate heirs' property so much is because when, whenever we have a disagreement, it's probably a very authentic, genuine difference of opinion, right? And that's what heirs' property does, is people have differences of opinion, 
And land is lost because of that, right? Whereas in a lot of other instances, land isn't necessarily lost. People come together and make a unified decision whether they agree or not, right? They can see the greater good. But in minority communities, the worst tends to happen because of very earnest disagreements, right? Um, did I, did I get, jump off there? Okay, okay, good. All right. Uh, this young man right here with the yellow, you, you had a question? Yes, sir, I was going to ask you. Uh, there, there are a lot of loggers out there. Some are good, some are bad. Yes, of course. Yeah. In between. Yeah. Um, what has your interaction been with the loggers? Have you found no, generally every logger I work with is solid, man. They, they take their job seriously, you know. Uh, they, they do a good job. You know, if you ask them to do something specific, they're going to do it. Um, I mean, you're going to have knuckleheads no matter what you do. Um, uh, but yeah, there, there are people out there who, you know, their whole thing is they just want to make a quick dollar and they want to get out of there, you know. Um, I, I'm sort of known, you know, the reality is I'm known as kind of being a cane corso when it comes to logging, <laughs> right? Um, first of all, I want to make sure that my landowners are paid for everything that leaves their property. And secondly, I want to make sure their property is left in a condition where we can do something with it afterwards, right? Um, we know that it's very common that a lot of times properties are kind of left in this very negative place, but um, all in all, I would say most of my experiences have been good, but I, but I definitely uh, have uh, the reputation of kind of being tough on loggers, yeah. Yes, sir. How do you think the decline in minority land ownership has affected enrollment of minorities into forestry and wildlife programs? That is a really good question. Um, here's the thing. African Americans in Mississippi and Alabama and Louisiana and Georgia are rural. African Americans, for the most part in the United States, have largely been rural. I came here, um, you know, my, my parents, had no idea what I was talking about when I said I wanted to go to forestry school. <laughs> you know, uh, they had no idea why I would want to do that. Several things were going on at the time. The Mississippi Department of Wildlife, Fish, and Parks was in the mid-90s. They were actually being sued because they had not hired um, minorities who had applied to be game wardens. And I, I remember hearing that. It was like 95, 96. I remember hearing that on the news at the time. Um, and then... Um, I knew that I loved to hunt, so I wanted to be one of those guys that rode around in the green trucks, right? Um, I think there are lots more folks just like me that don't realize that this is a viable career option, okay? Um, a very good career option. And I think that the reality is that, and I, I want to commend the college because a lot of that has changed since I was a student here. It was not a, it was not a hospitable place in a lot of, in a lot of regards. Right, um, but uh, a lot of that has changed. The profession has changed. Uh, it, I don't. Know, I think Sam Cook, who is he's African American, is now the chair of the Society of American Forests, right? Yeah. Or a past chair, immediate past chair, right? CEO, yeah, Terry Baker. Terry Baker, right? Terry Baker. So there's a lot of work that's been done there, but that's what needs to continue to happen. We need to have conversations that amplify the reality that the world is changing, that this is a very good career option, that it's a fun career, um, that, that you know, you can climb the corporate ladder if that's what you choose, or you can become a consultant if that's what you want. You know, those are the conversations that need to happen so that more people say, well, you know, this, this is a good opportunity, you know. Um, I, did I answer your question? Land, are they in oh, okay, yes, sort of activities that are going to draw them? To Great question. Yes. So um, I would say that definitely cuts down on the on the reality that people connect with land in the way that I did. Okay. Um, now I will say this: when I moved to northwest of Pennsylvania, I met a bunch of people from Pittsburgh. I was very surprised that so many African Americans in Pittsburgh hunted, right? And fishing up there is really huge. Right. Um, so it's not necessarily that it 
severs that sort of historical memory of what the outdoors are like, but it makes it much harder because, I mean, and I, this is really, but people, I'll never forget, we, we were, uh, we had some kids up from the, for the summer from Pittsburgh, and there was a young lady who, you know, they had brought her from Pittsburgh, she was on the bus, she would not get off the bus because she thought a bear was going to come out of the woods and eat her. She just really, you know, was like, I can't do this. So we worked with her for about a year. And I will never forget the last time I saw this kid. She climbed out of the van. She sat down on a, on a levee of a major lake. And she looked off into the woods for hours, right? And it, all it took was that sort of interaction. I think the fact that she saw me being comfortable and just, you know, going about my business and all of that, um, you know, the U.S. Forest Service has done a really great job in bringing about a lot of diversity, right? U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service on and on. Um, but I do think that that sort of historical memory of what it was like, most of the logging force until about the mid-80s was African American, right? Um, a lot of that has been severed by time and, you know, some of the other uh, issues, but I guess to answer your question, I'm just trying to do something about what you're, what, what, what you're asking, right? I'm trying to do my part. Yeah. Calling our Diversity Engagement Council because four of the main reasons why our enrollment doesn't reflect society are that awareness that Alex has mentioned. The second thing is the misperceptions about the jobs. I mean, many of them are still thinking that, or would think that forestry is a pulpwood truck and a chainsaw mm -hmm. yeah. instead of a management professional. Right. The third thing is the lack of role models. So that's why we need this engagement council, people like mm -hmm. Alex who can speak to groups and, and serve as a role model. And then the fourth thing we're doing is to engage these younger people in an outdoor environment so that they are active and, and doing things, whether it's a summer program, we even did an after school program here in Octavia Hall County last year. Sam Cook was here um, maybe a year ago. Through extension, we had a program here for underserved forest landowners, yeah. and, and including field trips. Mm -hmm. Because you're right, Chris, the, um, we're trying to address several approaches because it, it's not just a simple thing. Yeah. It's like all humans, it's a complex thing. I, I, I've said this before, and I, I'll say it again. I think that is a space where the College of Forest Resources could continue to be very helpful in engaging minority landowners. Because the more you engage those communities, the more they see a value in the College of Forest Resources and the profession as a whole. And um, I, I, I can't underscore how important I think that is because the reality is that these folks really see that they're up against it, you know, in terms of honest, solid advice and direction in terms of how to manage their, their assets. Um, they're, they're up against it and they, they don't feel that they can trust anybody. You know, but when there is, uh, I, <laughs> Doc, Dr. Grebner will tell you I, uh, about, what, two years ago I called and I was raising cane because we weren't getting the timber price reports that were coming out, <laughs> right? And I, my, my feeling was, is that we needed somebody to be sort of a formal voice to say, well, this is kind of where it is, right? Um, that we needed an institution that we could trust. And, and that is, you know, I, I feel very strongly about that, that, you know, that engagement. Now, I know that there's the extension and all of those sorts of things, but the extension is not the college, right? And that is, you know, I, I think to get to the root of your question, is we have to get to a place where we really think about what is most foundational to humanity. And that is a place and, and an environment where, where people can be reassured that there is somebody that maybe not necessarily is on their side, but is independent of being influenced by something that's against them, right? Um, yeah. You mentioned earlier, thanks for your talk, by the way. Thank you. Um, so you mentioned earlier that, you know, and, and, and hope that I'm quoting you as correctly as I can. Um, you said something about, you know, black land, black forest landowners 
being a sort of canary in the coal mine for issues that yeah. are facing big commercial growers. Mm -hmm. And so I guess what I'm wondering is what are some of those issues? Okay. What makes black landowners vulnerable to those issues? And then finally, what can we all learn from the experiences yeah. of black landowners? So here's the thing. The reality is when a landowner in general gets taken advantage of in a timber sale or when they don't, when they hire somebody and they actually get, so let's, so let's go back to the lady at, at, that was offered $80,000 and got $470,000. Imagine what she can do now in terms of what her future family situation looks like, right? Because she, she was treated fairly, right? The reality is when people are not treated fairly in minority communities, it has a much more negative effect because minority communities have much less to start with. So that's, that's the gist of your, your question, right? Um, the issues are very real issues, like climate change. It's going to become more of an issue, right? Um, um, you know, the issues of, of financial and economic return, creating uh, forest ecosystems that are resilient, that are a healthy and safe space for wildlife. I'll never forget, you know, uh, right as uh, the pandemic was starting up, um, how important fishing and hunting became to everybody at that point, right? Because you couldn't find ammunition, <laughs> right? People were really worried about their food systems and what they were going to do. We had huge issues on the Gulf Coast where people were getting sighted because they told people you couldn't fish for a, a, a while there, right? Because they said you had to social distance and we, <laughs> we didn't know what this thing was going to do. All of those things are very real things, you know, that that is what we do as conservation professionals, you know. But if we don't think about the issues of how they affect minorities, the, the next leg on that chair is the broader society, right? I want to echo, again, thanks for the talk. This is great. Uh, so I guess what I'm thinking about as, as we're hearing some of these stories is I'm hearing a lot of like uh, uh, black landowners being taken advantage of for timber stands that they already have. Uh -huh. right? So I guess my question is, what can or what is being done by, say, the university's forestry department, you know, state forestry, private consultancy firms, yeah. to um, to re reach out to black communities, <coughs> landowners specifically that already own land and yeah. like planting tree stands. Yes. This long term, right? Yeah. There seems to be a correlation with like losing yeah. land. And this, this. So that's that's where we created the sustainable forestry and land retention program that the USDA. So this is sort of a model for engagement of how to work within these communities. And the USDA actually uses that. And they, they, they now use it on Native American reservations. They use it in Hawaii, where heirs property is a huge issue out there. Um, there, you know, that, that was the whole point of all of that, was to figure out a way to address exactly what you've asked. Um, but again, this profession is extremely complicated. One of the things that tends to irritate me the most is when I'm talking to the average foresters that I know and they're kind of, you know, they kind of undersell how complicated things are. And, you know, the institutions that are out here that are the colleges, they have to be the leaders. They've got to be the leaders to settle a lot of the silly stuff that takes place. Um, they've got to be the leaders to, to set the tone for what's acceptable and what isn't. And I'm not saying that they haven't or they don't. Um, I will say that um, if, if somebody graduates from a college of forest resources and we, we hear that they're kind of taking advantage of landowners in a really nasty way, we should all be concerned about that, you know. There's a way to submit that claim against them. In other words, there's a, a mechanism yeah. to get that person. To help landowners. I, I think a lot of people in the minority communities feel, Doc, that they don't, that that doesn't happen. And a lot of them, again, they don't know about the border registration, right? And so, um, you know, that is, that, is, that is a continuing thing. Uh, that, there's a lot of work that needs to be done there. You have nonprofits that are doing this work. The Center for Heirs Property Preservation in Charleston, South Carolina, Royal Oak Electric Cooperatives, Federation of Southern Crops. You have all these nonprofits uh, 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 right here in Louisville. Winston County Self-Help. Right, right out there doing that work. Um, so there are people that are doing it. Um,
but I, you know, I, I'm again, I'm partial to the institution that I know and, and that raised me and made me in a way because um, I remember how that, how the tone was a very fair, calibrated, honest tone. And the reality is, I just don't think that tone exists enough in enough spaces. Um, yeah. Yeah, yes, yeah, that's, that's another one. So I, I have a, a partnership agreement with the Longleaf Alliance right now, and I'm having a landowner outreach meeting in Gulfport in the morning, right? I'm, over the next two years, I'll have, I think, a total of nine or 10 in Mississippi, Alabama, and Louisiana. Um, that's something that I'm doing toward that end, uh, where we're gonna, you know, I'll, I'll give a talk about how to manage your timber sale and how to work with a consulting forester. There'll be NRCS personnel, there'll be an attorney there to help with wills and estates and that kind of thing. Um, you know, um, a, a, there, the work is happening. I think, uh, you know, it, it's helpful to, to have partnerships so that the message is amplified, but you know, we also have the, the issue that is contingent is how many of these institutions really have a leg into those communities as well so that when they amplify, that that's heard. And I guess that's, that comes back to me. Well, how do I amplify larger, right? Um, yeah. One piece of good news on that, Chris, Alex, is on November 1st, I think, we'll take ownership, the college will take ownership of 14,000 acres on the Wolf River, close to Diamond Head. Mm -hmm. And we'll be building a facility there, an outreach facility, um, an on-site residential area but we'll be converting about 7,000 acres from Loblolly Pine to Longleaf back to the natural habitat. So it can be a great demonstration area, a place yeah. where you can have workshops. We can yeah. really partner in many ways. Yeah. yeah, I think that's important. One of the biggest challenges in South Mississippi is we're sort of getting into this really ur uh, urban uh, interface, right, where a lot of the communities down there don't understand this whole forestry stuff that I'm talking about. They, they don't get it, and they, and they don't because it's more of an urban environment, right? But again, that's, that's, there's a lot of work to be done, and I think there's a great opportunity for us to do that. You know. Yeah. So we were talking at lunch about EUDR, uh, the new EUD forestation, free regulation, whatever it is. And it made me think, um, we've talked a lot about the reciprocal way that forestry, that your work, particularly in forestry and history, inform each other. Mm -hmm. So we have some graduate students here, so I thought, like what, what are some productive lines of research in forestry? Uh, like, is it about like well-intended programs that have cascading effects way down the river? Yeah. Is it about certification and these cooperatives? Mm -hmm. Is it about studies that connect conservation and social equity? Um, definitely, definitely, definitely certification as well. What, what do you want to know more about? Yeah, um, I think that more of a historical. Uh, deep dive into African-American history of the forestry industry would be really pertinent in a lot of urban areas, okay? Um, whereas on the Mississippi Gulf Coast, you have this really important historical African-American community called Turkey Creek, right? And Turkey Creek it w is where, you know, they did all the naval, st naval stores. These are all, you know, the people that turpentine, you know, and all the, I can't think of the name list, but anyway, that is, that is, uh, that community itself is, uh, I've seen global conversations take place about Turkey Creek. But it's such a complicated issue, and uh, oh, it is, it's probably the most complicated issue where I've seen, okay, so you have this important historical community that was all longleaf pine for thousands of acres in, any, in either direction. And urban development happened in and around the community. So now you've got the, air, the international airport there, you've got Keesler Air Force Base, you've got Walmart, you've got all these things. When Katrina happened, a bunch of people were isolated in that community because of the flooding, right? But nobody has said, well, all along the Truckee Creek watershed, you've got all this pavement that should not be there, right? And so obviously in a situation like Katrina, there's going to be a bunch of water that needs to go somewhere that has nowhere to go. 
right? Um, these things are very real in minority communities. Now, people could tell you about what happened and how it happened and what it did to that community, but they don't necessarily understand, uh, you know, all the sort of scientific things that I don't think anybody's ever stood up and said, maybe we should look into this, you know, because when we, when we start talking about those things, we're bound to rub somebody the wrong way, <laughs> right? Um, but it's, it's very real, you know. Um, I, I answered your question, right? Okay, all right. Go ahead. Just a little bit of stuff. Okay, fine. <laughs> um, I like it. So I, I'm writing a dissertation on feral hogs in the South. Yeah. Yeah. Honey. And so I like to shoot them. <laughs> <laughs> they need to be shot. No. Okay. Um, so uh, because earlier you mentioned about creating forests with sustainable ecosystems for wildlife. And so I'm just wondering, in a lot of my research, I'm seeing farmers or timber tract owners who complain about feral hogs, but they're all white. Right, and so obviously hogs don't discriminate based off color. No, it's so I'm wondering, color. right, how much uh, disparity you may have noticed or seen or, or heard about oh, yeah, between yeah. access to these resources from the USDA or the Extension mm -hmm. Service for hog trapping and that kind of. You thing. know, uh, I would say in that regard, no, USDA is is very accessible uh, in that way to minorities, just like anybody else. They see that as a problem. They have tons of money to address the issue. I think. Uh, again, there's just uh, a gap between uh, minority communities fully understanding how to utilize USDA programs to meet those specific needs. Um, and, um, you know, that, that is definitely a, a place where I, I'm trying to take, you know, my company and, and, you know, more into environmental services, wildlife services, that kind of thing, because on the coast, hogs are really bad. We were riding in a pretty, uh, it was, it's a minority community in Delille, and coming back from New Orleans, and there was like six wild hogs and brought up in daylight standing right there by the road, you know? Um, and I've passed through there three more times and seen them, you know? Um, I'm, you know, my, my family land in Hines County, I mean, they, they're always out there, you know? Yeah, these issues, they're, they're not discriminatory in any way. They're, they're very real. and. I just think we have to continue the campaign of educating people about um, who is who, what we do, and how those things are useful for them. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Come on, man. It's got to be one more. <laughs> Go ahead. How do you go about investing it takes time, man. You know, you, you have to really spend a lot of time with them. Um, you, ha you have to really convince them on how these programs work. I, I, I'm going to be honest with you. Every situation is not the same in terms of working with landowners. So even if you explain to them, well, this is how this program could help you, um, you know, they, they may encounter some tone or some other thing, and they may say, well, no, I, I just don't want to do it. But I think as time continues to go by and people see success stories, that's how we build the SFLR program, you know, um, where people started seeing successes and then they went to church and they talked about it, you know, or they, they sat down at this function and they talked about it. And then we had more people to come and say, well, you know, I want to get a forest management plan and, and I want to sell some timber and, you know, I, I want to do these things. I, I think it's, you know, there's, even though you've got nonprofits that are doing the work and others, there are still lots of places that are sort of pockets where no one has ever done this work. You know, we need to have these conversations about Ayers property. You know, the college and extension hosts conversations all the time talking about wills and estates clinics, but I don't know that those conversations are the same in the way that they connect in underserved communities where people see, okay, um, I, I heard something that I recognize. The reality, I think, is a lot of times th those uh, conversations may not sound familiar. You know, when if, if, you, if you say heirs property in minority communities, people certainly understand what that is. You know, does that make sense? Yeah. Go ahead. Um, so, I, I, so and, and I know this is a complex question, so <laughs> forgive me. You don't have to answer it fully. <laughs> We would be here. Yeah. Um, but so, you know, I spend a lot of time teaching my students about heirs' property in my black studies classes. Yeah. And most of the time, 
Um, so, right, I note that it's an issue in Mississippi, but it's yeah. something I know less about. Right. Um, so most of the time, you know, I, I, I talk, I teach them about, you know, what happened in the Sea Islands, Hilton Head, mm -hmm. and all of that. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and, I, and I'm wondering. Noxipi National Wildlife Group. Yeah, well, well, so, so, so right now, right now, you're educating on something I didn't know about. Yeah. So, so. What I'm wondering is, are there any particular issues relating to Ayers property that are particular to, say, Mississippi or Alabama, that, that are distinctly, like, you can distinguish between what's going on on the coast? No, none that I would say, no, no. I don't think Ayers property works like that. Um, um, it has caused a lot of problems. Um, you know, um, it has criminalized a lot of people where it shouldn't have, but, um, I don't think there are specific instances that I've heard of where heirs property is sort of this unique thing in Mississippi. No, I, I would say no. Um, we've had some other unique things. A lot of people don't know, but um, so there, Mouston, Mississippi, there was a, a cooperative there starting in the 1940s that apparently a lot of people didn't know about, but the government set aside 10,000 acres from an old plantation that was there, and they... Uh, they created 70 experimental farms. And then they created uh, 30 parcels that were uh, this collective experimental farm. Um, and most of the people that are, that are in that area today, are the, they're the offspring of the people that, that started that. Um, but um, no, I, you know, heirs property works the same way kind of everywhere, uh, where you have to factor in the reality that um, lack of access to legal services that people trust has created um, an environment where people get further taken advantage of in terms of the resources that they have because if a timber buyer goes in and they know it's an air property situation they're going to offer much less um, and you know um, yeah I'm trying to think of an instance, but I can't think of anything unique to Mississippi in that way, no. Since you mentioned the wildlife work, you, you mentioned a historical example that I remember, so I was a freshman in forestry here in 1973, 51 years ago, and we had a professor that took us out to Beth Eden, the community of Beth Eden, which is still there, right there, kind of in the middle of, there's the Tom Bigby National Forest, the National Wildlife Refuge, and the John W. Starr Memorial Forest. Yeah contiguous lot thousands and thousands of acres and he stopped at the church in Beth Eden and he asked us why is that graveyard so big I mean there's a huge graveyard in the middle of a pine forest for miles and so that's an historical question understanding why that was people were plowing it goes back to what you mentioned with yeah. um, markets yeah. the only thing you can monetize is cotton and people are going to plant cotton on anything you can pull a mule, pull a plow on. Eventually the soil goes away and you can't make a living there anymore. The price goes down. Yep. And so the, the government acquired property because people weren't able to pay the property tax. That's right. Uh, you know. I saw this in Florida a couple of years ago. I didn't realize it was the same Mississippi. But um, if you're riding across the Delta, you always see these little small old churches on the edge of cotton fields. And it was because of this really complicated history where people worked in the field and they were allowed to go to church and they had to go right back to the field, right? And you'll see even some like really sm small uh, houses, you know, and then you see cemeteries too. And these kind of, you know, off distant corners. I mean, that's, that's, it's the same thing, you know, um, where, you know, you know, um, people had this, uh, this sort of really complicated I, I don't I don't want to necessarily, necessarily say situation but um, a lot of African Americans in urban centers felt like their relatives were confined um, you know even until the 50s and 60s and 70s right um, but you know to get to the the root of your point about the you know the cemetery and kind of is people lived there, and they've had this sort of really complicated connection to that space. And Beth Eden and many other spaces right around here, and I, I mentioned Knoxville Refuge, but a lot of people didn't know that a lot of that was African-American farmers. That, that land was taken via eminent domain and then 
put into, and a lot of national wildlife refuges. You know, we talk about South Carolina, well, Harris Neck and all of that up there, um, which, which we can talk another three or four hours about that situation, but, you know, um, yeah. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for the invite.